Hello and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Trent Bame, retired capital markets executive. Trent's career spanned three decades in the energy industry and roles from the boardroom to the executive suite and sales and trading. Among his many roles, Trent was a member of the first energy executive committee and participated in over 800 equity financings, raising in excess of $30 billion. Along the way, establishing a global energy platform with offices in Calgary and London, England. In addition, he's also been the vice chairman, head of energy sales and trading at Stifle Financial Corp, and is currently a board member of Western Energy Services. Trent graduated from the University of Calgary with a Bachelor of Commerce degree and a specialization in finance, and is also a CFA charter holder. We sat down for a smooth cup of Rose Bros coffee and discussed why it's the golden era for energy profitability and creative deal making, diversifying an economy, creating value for shareholders, and swimming with sharks. The full video of this episode is available on YouTube, so check out the Rose Bros channel, and if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. Also, This week's podcast is sponsored by Head Racing Canada. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, Head Canada Racing is offering the lowest prices available through its online storefront by passing on brick-and-mortar savings to customers. Check out headracingcanada.com for more information and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Enjoy. Also, this week's podcast is brought to you by Rundle Eco Services. Looking for a way to recycle your frack pond and pit liners used in the energy industry? Rundle collects and processes liners using an environmentally friendly system, leaving a clean environmental footprint. The end use of these liners are shredded and processed into pellets that can be used and extruded into various forms of usable plastic products, including furniture, various building materials, and industrial packaging. Check out rundleco.com for more details on how you can recycle your industrial pond and pit liners today. Is it Trent Bohm? Bame. Bame. Yep. Trent Beam, thank you very much for doing this. We are live now. Well, you're very welcome. It's a tremendous honor to to join you on this podcast. So looking forward to a uh, fun hour here. You're retired now, but by training your investment banker and energy executive, how would you describe your original career? Well, I started out as a uh, retail salesman right out of university, uh, selling mutual funds and stocks to private clients that lasted for maybe 10 years or sorry, about five years. I would say I got a call from uh, my former business partner, Jim Davidson to come over to first energy. And, and that launched an institutional sales career where my responsibilities were helping portfolio managers and issuers, uh, oil and gas issuers, primarily navigate the capital markets. Did that from 2002 to 2021. Did you always want to be an investment banker? No, I kind of fell into the role. I didn't really know much about investments. I come from a humble background. My father's a plumber up in Slave Lake. And uh, so I didn't know a a tremendous amount about this sector. I knew the oil sector because I worked in it. And, uh, you know, I entered the financial services sector not knowing anything about it really. And so I was very fortunate to have some great mentors and and over time, particularly after we, I moved over to First Energy, we built uh, we built an incredible powerhouse of a franchise there, which I'm you know, very honored and humbled to have been a part of. Do you remember your first day in investment banking? My first day, so we'll call that my first day. So it, technically, it's I was in institutional sales, which is different from investment banking. So let's call it the day I started at at first energy. And yeah, I do remember that day. It was, it was pretty exciting because I was walking into a situation where I had an extremely high degree of confidence regarding the product knowledge. You know, I knew oil and gas like the back of my hand by that time. And what was missing is I, I didn't have any relationships in Canadian capital markets. And it was a very, very exciting day because I could tell from the moment I stepped into that room, it had a tremendous energy and a tremendous brand already surging through the industry that was touching investors all over the world. And uh, it was, it was, I recall being very excited about now being part of that. Lots of people say they want to be an investment banker. Some actually do it. 
But not many people reach the top leadership positions. It's a lot of work, time away from family. And why do you think you were successful in investment banking? I was successful because I had great partners, great research analysts. We had a research product that I think was, I personally believe was one of the best in the world. You know, we had a, we had, I think we had 13 analysts dedicated to the energy sector, the Canadian energy sector, which at the time was a tremendous innovation. Uh, at that time, there were, there were, you know, an investment bank might have one or two or maybe three guys sitting off in a corner covering energy. We had 13 people, you know, so we, the, the, the quantity of thematic and company specific work that we dedicated to the sector was, was profound. I think somebody, somebody measured it in terms of the height of the pages that we would produce in a year. And they said it was like a 10 story tall building. If, if you stacked all of the research up leaf by leaf, you know, over, over the period of a year. First energy, just for anyone that is listening to backup was unique at its time because it was one of the first smaller investment banks that serviced local energy companies in the Western Canada market. It was in fact the second one. The, the first one was a company founded, I believe in the seventies called Peters and Co. Some of my very good friends continue to work there and, you know, were very successful and they were a terrific competitor, uh, and remain powerhouse in this, uh, you know, a powerhouse in this sector. First Energy was a combination of a few people from Peters and Co., believe it or not, and some other investment banks that left to form First Energy. They thought there were some, maybe some different ways to approach the business and, Turned out that that uh, market was, there was quite a bit of room, not only for the two of us, but, you know, it became a, a very, very active market in the, the first part of the millennium, you know, where fundraising in oil and gas, I think at its peak reached, don't hold me to this number, but I think at its peak, the industry raised something like 15 or 20 billion in a single year. So, you know, it was a very, very active time. The idea was to service the capital strain juniors that were raising money, going out exploring for oil and gas in Western Canada. That's correct. And, and around the world, we had, we, we covered a number of international companies as well. And, uh, you know, the, the energy sector is very different at that, at that time. Companies were deeply concerned with meeting the world's need for energy. And at that time, there wasn't a negative aspersion cast upon oil and gas. In fact, it was it was one of the the more important industries, not only in Canada but around the world. And and growth investors would would seek out oil and gas opportunities as core parts of their portfolio. So companies tended at that time to have high valuations. They frankly tended to be less efficient operators because they were constantly competing for, with other companies that were also well capitalized. And so there was a lot of competition for services, for land, uh, for employees. You know, the result was it was a very exciting time because companies could go out and raise equity capital, let's say at 10 or 8 or 12% cost of capital, and they would be drilling projects that, you know, had, you know, tremendous returns. So, uh, the, you know, much higher returns than, than say the 10 or 12%. So we would, uh, you know, there was a, a mad rush to deploy capital as quickly as possible in order to capture those returns. The other attribute of the market that was fascinating at that time is it was a period where very large companies, international companies were leaving Canada. And so at that time you saw a proliferation of, of opportunities, uh, just many hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them. I, you know, I don't know. And so small companies would form, they'd crop up out of nowhere magically like mushrooms on a, on a humid morning. And they would find funding through companies like First Energy and, and, and they would go out and create uh, tremendous value for sh shareholders. Do you think there was too much capital going into the industry at that time and the capital allocation skills were kind of left in the wind at times? And Absolutely not. I mean, the oil and gas business and then the resource businesses 
business generally is like is like any other growth business. And so uh, there was exactly the correct amount of capital that went into that business until the day that there wasn't. I mean, it's not for us to sit here and, and decide that somebody should or shouldn't pursue an organic, like an opportunity. And it might be a good opportunity or it might be a crappy opportunity, but that's capitalism is to go out. People have dreams and they'll take risk and they'll convince other people through their leadership abilities and their understanding of the data that this is an opportunity that's, that's worthy of the risk. And they'll go out and, and, uh, you know, we, that, that for me was the number one reason why I loved my job. Cause I could surround myself and be part of that creative destructive process that, that was so powerful and influential in, uh, in Canada. Some people say maybe at the same time, the trust market grew, those types of companies were coming up at the same time. And that it was maybe a little bit of a pyramid scheme. The critic might say that the whole structure was based on that. What would you say to that? There's no doubt. I mean, there, there's an old saying in the energy sector, there's two places to find oil and gas. You can find it in the oil field or you can find it in the stock market. The trust model was great because it went around buying these small companies on the stock market or privately that found oil and gas. And their job was to, to gather a different category of professional, exploitation engineers, production engineers, accountants, that manner of person to keep the fields running, not necessarily to grow them. And I think that's perfect. That's great. And in fact, it's kind of migrated now. Like if you go fast forward 10 years, 15 years, what are all these companies now? But trusts, they, you know, they are harvesting this cash flow and paying it out at very, very healthy returns. It was the golden era, the 80s and 90s, and the Canadian energy, made, especially for deal making. Mm -hmm. Do you think that era is past now for deal makers, or what's your thoughts on that? I would say to you that what we're talking about here is the, the notion that companies will be able to create value through transactions. And I think that, I think every day in the oil and gas business is the best day to do a deal. I know that sounds really weird, but the volatility in this sector is so profound that when things are horrible, like they were in the deep, deep carnage that was meted out to the sector uh, by the, you know, the five or you might even call it a 10 year depression in oil and gas created enormous opportunities. And before that downturn, well, guess what? There were also like people sold and they did very, very well. So that was a great opportunity. So do I think that, that the golden era for, for oil and gas transactions is over? No. In fact, I would argue that we're probably entering a new period where assets have become very, very consolidated. Mark my words, something's going to happen. And I don't know what it is. Nobody does. But something's going to happen to disrupt that consolidation. And some of these big companies will now have to start shedding assets. And then that will spur the proliferation of a new model, which, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but a new model, a new pathway for the sector. Everybody's going towards quote unquote capital allocation now in the form of share buybacks and raising dividends. But some are still pursuing the growth model. Mm-hmm. I had Rob on the podcast from Coelacanth. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could argue that that's the new opportunities to go on growth now when everybody else is chasing dividends and share buybacks. So it's funny you mentioned that. I've been thinking about that characteristic in the market for probably two years. Because it was very clear even in 2019, it was clear that oil and gas companies were going to become much more conscious of rate of return on capital employed and less return about on growth. And the reason, and the reason that happened is because a few investors uh, in Canada and the United States got together and they said, Look at all the capital that the energy sector in North America is destroyed. Like, look at it. It's unbelievable. Sure, we've got great production growth and, you know, oil production in North America is pushing 12 million barrels. But we're, these companies are not making any earnings. So they said, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to march into the management 
into the boardrooms and, and, and force management to change their compensation structures in such a way that they get paid, not when the number of barrels increase and the number of res- like reserves increase, production increases, but when there's a, a, a rate of return hurdle. And guess what happened almost overnight? These companies started managing their business in that way. And, you know, it's, it's a, it, it is a reality that COVID and, you know, first of all, there was the battle between Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, when they, try, when they uh, conspired to, to lower oil prices. Then there was COVID and that all hit sort of within a three-month period. Well, that really accelerated the process that I discussed dramatically because the strongest companies had already been moving in that direction. So they were able to survive the weakest companies that were, they didn't have the assets or the, the management philosophy or the boards that could push those efforts just disappeared. And so now we're in a situation where almost all of these companies are um, focused primarily, like the ones that matter are really focused on, on generating tremendous rates of return. And the kinds of dividends that we're seeing in this sector are like, yeah, I never would have predicted anything of that nature, but there's a consequence. And the consequence is this, we have a global energy crisis now. There's been no growth and oil and gas is a, is and will continue to be an absolutely core energy source for humanity for decades to come. And so we find ourselves in this funny situation where the investors and, in fact, even the enemies of the, of the sector, the ESG movement, uh, which has told us time and again, we'd like to see less capital spending on oil and gas initiatives, you know, less oil and gas. Well, it, everybody's gotten their wish. And what it's created is an industrial sector that is if it's not the healthiest industrial sector in the world right now, I, I don't know what is. Um, but these companies are generating, they're deleveraging or reducing their indebtedness at a pace that I would never have thought possible. Do you think the pendulum will swing back? Absolutely. It, it will come to pass. It will come to pass maybe soon. Maybe it'll take a couple of years where the politicians that have, created an, a hostile environment towards energy development are pass on, you know, their terms will uh, end and new people will come in and those people will be listening to their electorate and the electorate will be saying energy prices are too high. And at that point in time, things will change because at that point growth will then be rewarded and companies that you know, like for the longest period of time, and it's even happening now and again today, companies that tend to grow, might not have terrific valuations, but that will change and the growth will become valued because people will, uh, both investors and, and consumers will have realized we've, as a society, made a tremendous mistake by destabilizing the energy sector in order to pursue a transition in low energy density technologies. Mm-hmm. The generalist investor might say growth is great, but the analogy is that you're stacking your warehouse with widgets that you don't need and that you're unsure whether you can sell. So huge reserve builds ups and massive acquisitions and all that is nice, but the idea is to make money for the investor. So how do you balance growing the company without stacking the warehouse full of widgets? You do exactly what's happening right now. And that is, you know, you know for instance, an oil and gas company, why would they ever why would an oil and gas company ever pay more than three or four times cash flow for an asset? Like, why would they do that now? Because we're reliably informed that in five or 10 years, there will be no terminal value to these businesses. And we're seeing, we're seeing this amplified quite dramatically in the coal sector, which, as you probably know, has, you know, the, the, the fight that that industry has had over the last 10 or 15 years makes oil and gas one look pretty pretty easy by comparison. And they'll trade between one and two times EV to EBITDA. You can buy the company's shares for, say, $10, and they will generate $10 in cash flow in, say, 18 months. And why is that? Because the market says there's going to be no terminal value. But what has happened in the coal sector? Coal energy demand has go- is continuing to grow. 
day by day. And we are now in a situation where, you know, diffuse, dilute energy technologies such as wind and solar have disrupted the grids in, in many countries. And these companies or nations are having to go back to coal. And we are now, as a globe, producing more coal than ever before. It's preposterous. And so, and yet these companies are still being valued between one and two times cash flow. So because of, because of the irresponsible pursuit of questionable technologies, we've now put the, you've, you've actually not only not achieved your objective, you've achieved the exact opposite of what you wanted to achieve, which was to create a terminal value, like terminate coal production. And it was because you had a largely, uh, you know, the people pulling their strings here were largely compromised by their uh, willingness to pursue subsidies and political, you know, political rents in order to build these businesses up. So now you're in a situation where, like, I honestly don't know how we get out of the situation in an, in an orderly time frame, like in two, three years. You know, you've got... You know, you've got electricity trading on an energy, an oil and gas equivalent basis of like a thousand dollars a barrel in Europe, a BOE right now. It's incredible. These are numbers like this all started to blow up last year around October time frame, and I thought at that time for the prices were high. And I sent me thinking to myself and managing my own, you know, my own wealth in a, in a way so that I you know wasn't exposed to like a big collapse or big risk. Of, of collapse. And it turns out I was completely wrong. I should have been doing the exact opposite at that time because energy prices have increased by, you know, a hundred to 300 percent in some places. You're smart. You understand the financial markets and you've seen companies come and go, prices go up and down. You understand cash flow and valuations and all that, but some management teams don't get that. So the generalist investor would say, I don't want your growth because I've been burned. And not all CEOs get that. How do you how do you balance that growth with prudent capital allocation? Well, I think that what you're finding nowadays is the management teams have gotten the lessons. The ones that are that don't get the lessons either run okay. an extremely compelling business model where you know you you, you okay. can see why you should grow this business. It's not an average business, okay. You, an idea, you know, an example of that, there's there's a, a play in Canada called the Clearwater Oil Play. And uh, it is highly, highly profitable. It is, it is, to my knowledge, the most profitable oil play in the world. So it's lowest cost, tremendous scalability, you know, and it's gone from zero to, I think, 60,000 or 70,000 BOE a day. And it's probably going to be a 200,000 barrel a day play. It, very, very significant. You should grow that play because you put a dollar into a well and it turns into $7, $8. So that is something that you should grow. People can get behind that. But for the average, call it quote unquote, scare quotes, average company, the new model is doing exactly what you've described. And I really liked your, uh, your imagery there of stack, you know, filling the warehouse. You know, what's that warehouse going to be worth in three or four years? Well, that's guess what? That's exactly what these companies are doing. So they will drill, and the market is giving them three, four, you know, if you're lucky, five times cash flow valuations. But you're not, these companies are for that reason, you know, that's a like a three times cash flow valuation, just call it a 35% cost of capital. Well, I'm not going to drill any 10% return wells, you know, if I got a 30% cost of capital, that would be dilutive. I'm going to take that money that I've made from my existing portfolio and I'm going to dividend it out. It's perfect. It's pretty good. And what, so now what happens is this, we've, we're called two years into this process, maybe three, we're in an energy crisis. So now that well, that used to be a 15% return well, well, guess what? It's now a 50% return well. So maybe someday that location can be drilled because energy prices are higher. Right. But for now, you got to lead towards the job. higher return projects. Yeah. You have to because of your, of your valuation. And those well, like we're not going to see rampant, out of control growth if oil companies like, the, you know, the greatest oil companies in Canada, mm -hmm. like Canadian Natural, like Tourmaline, like, you know, Whitecap, you know, for example, and there's several others, ARC. These companies trade, frankly, appalling valuations and 
you know, for the risk that that a company takes in terms of uh, operational risk and financial risk to to create the projects that they create for them to trade it five times. For me, it's it's laughable. It, it shows a, a, a stark misunderstanding of the uh, the risks and the difficulty and the logistics that it takes to keep 100 million barrels per day of oil flowing in the world. As a generalist investor, if you didn't work in the energy industry and you were coming out of nowhere, say, from not Calgary, the returns that are being generated right now, would that catch your eye if you were an investment banker in Toronto or an investor in general? Yeah. So let's talk about the investors because they're they're probably more relevant to the situation. You come from Toronto. Yeah. I would say to you that there's a growing awareness that you can't eliminate energy from your portfolio. Many of them have. And frankly, they're smart to have done so because for 10 years, it was yeah, sure. kind of crappy. Yeah. And the last four years, you know, before COVID, between 2016 and say 2020, they were a lot, a lot worse than crappy. Crappy would have been quite complimentary. So, you know, that and that went on and on. Now, in the background, you had the ESG movement and suddenly there became a high moral purpose to not have oil and gas in your portfolio but for the most part, I'd say that investors, generalists, uh, growth investors, they're agnostic to sector. You know, there may be people in some of these firms who are not money managers or not wealth managers, and it is their job to pursue ESG type uh, initiatives within their firms. They may retain consultants, which tell them that it's important. But for the most part, the wealth managers that I had the privilege of knowing were interested in generating returns for their clients. And so if their hands were, were handcuffed, it wasn't because they were not interested in, in opportunities in the energy sector. It was because their, their hands were handcuffed. So I would argue that now that we're in a situation where broader market averages are, are creating a much more difficult environment for a generalist to differentiate themselves. And in fact, they're, they're, they're down, like they're losing money. Like the S&P is down by 20% or something right now. They're looking at energy again because they see, they see strong businesses. I mean, they're, you know, they're comparing this, these, these businesses that generate, you know, that have a, say, a three-year payout in their business with a long runway of growth and a commodity backdrop. Like right now, you can say, yeah, it's, you know, barring some black swan event or a deep cyclical downturn globally, energy prices will be high. So I've got strong earnings visibility. I've got strong and improving balance sheets. Uh, and I have low valuations. Tremendous optionality for for uh, any kind of a generalist investor there, and you know he'll compare that with healthcare, tech, you know, technology, other materials businesses, manufacturing businesses, and they'll make a decision to to invest. Are you seeing that more now? Yeah, I think we are seeing that definitely. There's a uh, well, here's an example. So just today, the comptroller in the state of Texas announced that they're banning certain funds from managing state uh, retirement assets and as, you know, assets generally. Shocking development. Why are they doing this? They're doing it because they did a survey of a lot of their service providers. These would be big, big fund companies like BlackRock, all the way down to maybe smaller businesses that we've never heard of, saying, your business, your money management business is not focused on the best practices of generating a return for our investors. It's focused on a political and opaque, opaque processes, selection processes that, that are pursuing a political agenda. And the state of Texas believes that that's inappropriate for their retirees. Then, and they want money managers that are focused on generating, identifying good companies and good investment opportunities on their own merits and making those investment opportunities. So maybe there is a bit of a backlash. No, let's call a spade a shovel. What do they produce in Texas? Oil and gas. So they're making a political statement there. But, you know, that, that they're not going to be the last people that do that. You know, there's, there's a fund set up by a gentleman whose name I can't remember recently, but it's specifically mandated to pursue opportunities that are, are not pursued explicitly, such as oil and gas, by, you know, ESG-focused uh, investors. 
So I think that's a rich mine. It's a it's a beginning of a new movement. People are I I believe that investors are, you know, these are very very high performing intelligent people and they if you go into money management generally i have found these people have a very high moral standard of themselves you know they 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 go way beyond the prudent man rule in terms of trying to ensure that they're doing the right thing for their investors it's both good business for them as individuals and it's good for their clients so if they have an opportunity that is you know in an in in an industry like oil and gas which is a great environmentally responsible industry in Canada, then they're, you know, they want to do it. And on those days when the oil and gas company, like, you know, these things go in cycles. So in, maybe in 10 years, you'll have me back on the podcast or maybe not, but let's say you do. Maybe oil and gas companies will be terrible on that day because they've, you know, the cycle has swung, their multiples have expanded. They can raise money at very, very high valuation. So they go and pursue all the 15% wells and the 10% wells, right? And oil field services, Prices are way up and, you know, just, it's just run and gun and let's get as much oil and gas as fast as we can. You know, on those days, maybe some of those investors that we're talking about might step aside and they're going to put some more money into Visa or MasterCard instead of oil and gas. Yeah. That's what journalists are scared of, I think, is that. But, I mean, if you understand the nature of the industry, then you're probably aware of that. But on the subject of ethics and the best investors of them all, Warren Buffett bought, I think he owns like half of Occidental now. No, he owns about 20%, I believe, but he has received authorization to buy half. So speaking of value and good investment returns, that pretty much is the best. Yeah, Warren, is, Warren Buffett, uh, Mr. Buffett, I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but he's turned out to be a pretty good oil trader because he's been, he was a seller of oil for a long period of time too. But now he's a buyer. So he's, but I mean, he, and I think that it, it you know, people forget that he sold Anadarko to, Oxy and it was a disaster, like it was a disaster for Oxy. I mean, he kind of bided his time and, and, you know, then the crash came and, and Oxy changed its ways. And now he, now he's long. Yeah. You know, he's buying Anadarko back. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Through, exactly. through Occidental. <laughs> yeah. But I think what they see, I think what they see is some of the, the, the matters that we've, we've discussed is that the, for the first time in my career, uh, I believe that what they see is a relatively bulletproof uh, forward curve for oil and gas because of the damage that was done through 2019 through 2022 uh, to the ability of the sector to produce. And that is the number one thing. The key problem in oil and gas or the key opportunity is what we started off talking about is capital spending. There's just not enough of it, and that's just the way it is. There's not enough capital spending to keep 100 million barrels a day of oil going and however much gas we make these days. Like, I mean, it's just not enough. And as a result, guess what? High prices, prices, energy shortages, war, famine, you know, for the, you know, the good of the children, we need to spend more. But... In Calgary and in Houston, we've been telling people that for years. It's like, hey, I know you think we're a bunch of cowboys, and, you know, maybe we are, but you're not going to be very happy, you know, if if we stop drilling. It's like, oh, yes, we will. We'll be very happy. We have, we're going to have all of these wind turbines. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have hydrogen production, and it's going to be amazing. Well, guess what? All right, COVID came. They shut down the industry, and we're struggling, struggling worldwide to maintain production. Do you think prices, maybe not hundred dollars a barrel of oil, maybe it won't be that high, but do you think that maybe that band between 70 and 90 is sustainable? I think that's a very sustainable value. Yeah. It, it, so I've been through two hot, you know, high price, um, episodes in my life and, or is this just too They, hard to they both kind of fell apart at 120. Yeah. Now we'll see. I don't know. There's been inflation. You know, we could be in a situation in the next year or two where the economy in in North America becomes so um, problematic for policymakers that maybe the U.S. Federal Reserve pivots to a more accommodative, you know, situation despite 5% inflation. And you never know. Like maybe that oil goes to 200. 
Um, I don't know what takes it really, really low, but you know, I didn't see COVID coming either. So who knows, you know, but what, what I think I can say with some confidence is that the energy companies that matter, what I call the generals, there's probably a dozen or 15 of these companies that I keep track of. All but one of them are single-handedly focused on return on capital employed, which is, which is, uh, highly differentiated from where we were and where we have been. And that's not going to change. You've had a really successful career in the energy industry for quite some time now. Um, You've seen high prices and low. Have you ever had an inkling, a feeling that maybe this is too low or maybe this is too high, like 120 was too high? (laughs) Well, I joke with my my colleagues and friends. It's like uh, I'm a very emotional person. And so when I am absolutely despondent. Yeah. That's a, you should definitely be buying uh, oil and gas. Yeah. Uh, and that was definitely the case in 2021. I was <laughs> so despondent. And there's an old saying, uh, you can't hate something that you don't love. And that's that was me in 2020 and 2021. So I just hated the business because it had betrayed me. And, uh, and it was at that time that I met the great... Uh, George R. Moyen, who is uh, he's a one of the great great businessmen that I've had the privilege of of meeting, and he's a very contrarian investor. And he came to Calgary, and I I've been dealing with him just peripherally for years. He called me up one day and he said, "Trent, how's it going?" And I recall it vividly. I was in Eighth Avenue Place in the lobby, and I said, "Well, George, it's terrible. Like it's literally it's the end times." He said, "That's amazing." I'm going to come out and visit some companies and, you know, we're going, <laughs> we're going to, he got very, very busy. He bought many, many companies in Calgary and, uh, at, you know, at a time where I'm looking at, I said, George, are you sure you know what you're doing here? <laughs> you know, this company is going to be bankrupt. And, uh, you know, of course it didn't go bankrupt and it, and it went on to become very, very successful and da, 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 da. So, I mean, uh, Yeah. So those are those are great lessons that I hope if somebody was listening to this that they should they should take away in the oil and gas sector. The oil and gas could be with us for a long time. And at the time when it's 150 or 200 dollars a barrel, yeah, you should and you're really happy and you're the smartest guy around. Yeah, you should definitely be tapping some bids. Um conversely when you know, you can't find a college kid to to take a petroleum engineering program. Well, maybe Maybe you should be looking at uh, at lifting some offers. Do you remember when tourmaline was like seven dollars a share? Vividly, I remember that pretty well. Yeah, they've paid out seven dollars in dividends now. Mm-hmm. the The list is endless. There's a small company called Journey Energy. It's, yeah. I think it's six bucks right now, or seven, five somewhere up there. Traded at ten cents a share. You know, the guy, the guy that runs that company is one of the most, the most honest, competent, capable, uh, small cap oil and gas guys that I've ever met. He's a great guy. Stock went to 10 cents, you know, and I think it, I don't know. I don't know if it was all of his net worth, but it was a good chunk of his net worth. Like he was not having a good time there, (laughs) but now, but he stuck with it and now his stock is up. So, you know, those are the perfect, those are the kinds of, of, uh, those are the kinds of investments that, that smart investors like, uh, Mr. Armoyan that I just, that I, that I'd mentioned, you know, not journey specifically, but, uh, you know, but those are the kinds of sentiments that, that they look for when they're, they're going to make a, a big, big, uh, commitment to an area, you know, do you see the collective ego of downtown rise in direct correlation to the price of oil? No, no. Calgary's a very humble place now. Uh, we've been through a lot. Really? Yeah. There was a time when we had a bit of a swagger, but I would say to you that people in Calgary now are a lot more measured uh, about, you know, just looking over the shoulder. And and I think, you know, listen, it shows up in capital structures of companies. You know, comp- back in the day, we two times debt to cash flow would have been quite normal that was like not even that long ago yeah that would have been normal yeah. so you, and they'd say oh, two to two times debt to cash flow mid-cycle so which means that <laughs> they're saying yeah we're happy with four or five times you know at the bottom <laughs> and, and then mid-cycle you know you never get to the you know top part of the cycle with right. these oil and gas guys so yeah so they you know the 
Yes, but now, I mean, look, tourmaline will be debt free. They're probably debt free right now, yeah. like on this date. Yeah. Um, but, you know, debt free by year end. Uh, Vermilion will be effectively debt free. Uh, you know, all these companies are going to like a, like a zero net debt status. Canadian Natural is on its way to near zero net debt. This is unprecedented. So when you talk about, you talk about the attitudes of Calgarians. I mean, it, it, it shows up in their own balance sheets. It shows up in the business's balance sheets, and the balance sheets are conservative right now. And I think they'll remain that way. Record revenue for the provincial government, too. Indeed. Yeah. Who would have thought? This time, even last year. Well, it's amazing what happens when you have industrial development in an economy, right? The, like these businesses that are pr- providing uh, the, you know, the lion's share of that revenue are businesses that have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the province, hundreds in, in high quality, long life, multi-decade long projects. That is the kind of economic development a, 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 we need. And we don't, we need it more in, than in just oil and gas. There's many things that we could be doing with our energy resource here. The government of the last five years has been on its heels. It's, that is a, that is a fact. But it's not anymore. And I, I strongly believe that we should be, you know, you know we're, we're going to continue to fight a battle to get our resources to tidewater. But rather than fight the battle, maybe what we should really be doing is saying, okay, concede that the reality is what it is and start bringing industries here. Because guess what? They're shutting down aluminum smelters in, in Europe because of the price of electricity. They're shutting down petrochemical plants. They're shutting down, like, we have an infinite amount of energy in this province. It's like, listen, you can haul your raw materials on a ship, put it on a train, and you can smelt your aluminum here in Alberta. Because guess what? You can park yourself right on top of a big gas field or right next to the Nova gas transmission system and get as much natural gas as you need to run your smelter. Boom, done. So these are the, you know, these are the initiatives that I think that this, this province should be pursuing with a tremendous urgency. Kind of like Texas, they seem to have a little bit more balance, like SpaceX, yeah. Tesla, oil and gas, farming. Tech. Well, Tesla's, uh, Tesla is one of the greatest states in the world because in addition to having its energy resource, being self-sufficient in energy, Te- it has a coastline. Yeah, like they have everything. Yeah, so it's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous, you know, yeah. it's almost impossible to fail if you're Texas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I thought would be cool if Alberta could do is like, yeah. who cares? Like, just open it up to business. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Say what you will about Bitcoin, but even that, like, why not just let it go? You know? and, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. It's not for us to pick, you know, exactly. pick choose the winners. Exactly. So, yeah. In a nutshell, energy is not a sunset industry. No. And in fact, uh, owing to the demographics of the sector, I would say to you that it's probably it's probably one of the most exciting industries uh, a young person could could consider right now. Remember, it does, if you don't like going to sit out, you know, beside wells, there's lots to do with energy, right? I mean, you, if you like, if you like you know, some of the other technologies, you know, things like wind turbine, solar, that kind of stuff. That's part of our future too. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in energy. I mean, building power plants, you know, these are going to be needed. Uh, it's, you know, it's a really fascinating time. Do you think the most opportunity might still lie in oil and gas kind of getting in at the time when it's booming or where would you look? Well, listen, I know that, you know, one of the problems that I have in, in my professional career right now is identifying people to come into the business. And it's a real problem. Like it's, you know, for many, many years, the, uh, you know, there, there was a joke that, that I had whenever I heard an oil field contractor say we can't get people. It was like, yeah, they can't get people until you, you know, pay them a little bit more. Uh, but after the last downturn, that sort of negotiating tactic that the oil field used in talking to their upstream customers became true. <laughs> and so you can't, you can't find people that want to come back and work on a frack spread. You can't find people that want to work on a rig. Like we could stand up dozens of rigs in Canada today 
if we could find the six man crews that could safely uh, and competently operate them. So we have to go through these, in, in, you know, first of all, find the high quality people. And there's lots around convince them that this is a good long-term choice for them and their families, train them and then put them to work. And hopefully they'll do a great job. Yeah. So it, it just takes time. And, you know, people are coming back to the sector, but you know, People, you know, an oil and gas company right now, if they put off drilling a well for, for 90 days, that could mean millions and millions of dollars of lost revenue. Yeah. Critic might say, though, I, I'd like to work in oil and gas. Energy's great and all that pays good. But the next downturn, they're just going to lay me off. And there's not really much uh, loyalty in that sense. That's ex- one of the main reasons why people are reluctant to return. Yeah. I guess that's just the nature of the industry. And it is. Business. Yeah. And the only thing you can say to that now is, 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 you know, you can offer them no reassurance in that regard. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball. However, what we can say is, you know, conversations like this that are raising awareness about the reasons for the energy shortage are not being addressed. And the, uh, as a result, every day that is perpetuated increases in length of time that you'll look at this sector as a logical, safe, productive place for somebody to build their future. And I think we're at that point. You know, if somebody were to enter this industry today, say a young person decided to take geology. Got to get a mortgage, (laughs) buy a house. (laughs) But, you know, they would be able to find a very good job right out of school. And they would be employed probably at very, very high compensation for 10 years anyway, right now. So, and if you're a rig hand, I mean, I, you know, there are some companies that are taking old rigs off the fence right now and refurbishing them and putting them back into the field. Well, those rigs won't be shut down again in, in 180 days. You know, they will, they will be active now for, for years. And that's a big opportunity, I think, is for, for people to recognize that the very fact that they themselves are having reticence. And maybe that's like that's sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's maybe, you know, maybe that's the opportunity. And for capital in the office, it seems like that, yeah, there's opportunity still, even not catching the bottom of the market. But if you're managing capital, oil and gas has some real, even for the generalists, attractive qualities to it now in terms of shareholder returns? It's 100%. The industry has been transformed. When I started in the sector, we talked about, you know, Slave Point Wells and Montney Plays and the Cardio. You know, we talked about technical matters. First Energy cut its teeth on doing, we call them play, like playbooks or whatever. We do analysis of various plays and present that to the buy side, highly in-depth, geotechnical research on these on these uh, various uh, oil and gas plays today it's like you bring out a map in a meeting and it's like you get kicked out of the room so what are your financial returns yeah what you know what am i getting for the dollar that you invest and nowadays you're like they're you know you're investing a dollar and you're getting cash flow of five or six dollars like it's the, the numbers are astonishing Back in the olden days, the day in the early 2000s, you invest a dollar to make cash flow of 50 cents. Yeah, for sure. So these businesses are, are flourishing. I would say to you that the income statement of, of a high-quality oil and gas company today bears more similarities to the, the income statement of Visa than it does to an, an oil and gas company from 10 years ago. Really? Yeah. Do you think it's still possible to create that massive wealth in terms of organic growth and through the drill bit, or is it kind of a mature basin and all the discoveries have been made and that now we're just kind of in harvest mode? An old oilman, I asked that question of an old oilman back in, in the early 2000s in Chicago over a beer. And he said, Trent, there's going to be some young guy, some young team, you know, that's going to run right up the middle and surprise everybody. You know, they're going to take some play that people had thought was just, you know, marginal, non-existent. They're going to, they're going to run with it and they're going to, they're going to shock the world. So that's happened twice in my 
career in Canada, when they say the basin's all tired out, you know, it was the Bakken in Saskatchewan, which went from nothing to, I think it was pretty sure it was 200,000 barrels a day at the peak. And then now that's clear water play. So no, I, the industry is not dead. There's going to be another play. But the geology-led companies are few and far between, like a, a tourmaline, right? The classic. Those aren't, they're not as common anymore. You mean geologically focused? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. That's why this is such an interesting time. There's, you know, there are fewer people in the sector. And, and the older gentle, ladies and gentlemen in the sector are probably going to cash out on this run. Yeah. Like people my age and older, are, they're not going to stick around for the next run. They're done, you know looking at logs and negotiating land deals. You know, it's time for them to enjoy, you know, their Tom springs. Exactly. So I think that that's, that's the really interesting part of this market because there's going to be that 35 year old guy that, that was working in the background of, of one of these oil companies. It's going to, you know, there won't be the budget for this particular project, but the opportunity will exist. They're going to go out, they're going to take the risk. They're going to find financial support. And they're going to be successful, and we don't know who they are yet. You have to keep your nose to the ground. But you know, there are there are some very very smart people in this sector, and they're entrepreneurial and great managers, and they're going to do some amazing things. What makes a good energy entrepreneur to you? Is it the brilliant geologist? Is it the guy who understands capital allocation? Is it the good engineer? Or is it all of it kind of mixed together in one? You can probably say this for any industry, but the 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 most successful business business people over the longer terms to me were sensitive. Uh, they were properly sensitive to what capital markets were asking of them, which is not to say they would do whatever the capital markets asked of them. It's that they would structure their business in a way which gave investors the highest probability of having the energy company meet their screens. So at a time, for instance, when growth was very important, the best managers would try to grow their businesses rapidly. Did they know that at the time? <laughs> How many people actually know that? I think that, that? It's instinctively the, be- the best managers will do that. I mean, we've all met that brilliant scientist that, you know, don't trust him to cross the street, but... You sure want them working on your projects. So the best the best managers, the best wealth builders are guy are people who were who could bring that technical competency and meld it with a, a worldliness that would cause capital to flow in from many different places and give them the ability to execute that plan. And for the most part, you know, because the industry has been whittled down so dramatically, most of the guys that you'd be talking to are are guys like that. Yeah, kind of self-select. Exactly. You've seen a lot of deals, a lot of companies built and sold, a lot of entrepreneurs come and go. Are there any that stand out to you in terms of the most value created, maybe a certain deal or a company or transaction that really went from 10 cents to like $10? Yeah. I, uh, well, listen, the, the legendary oil and gas people in, in Canada are, you know, are well known to everybody, you know, they've, and they've been around for multiple cycles. You know, the Mike Rose from Tourmaline is a tremendous leader, uh, just an absolutely tremendous part of our community. Uh, and, you know, he's surrounded by an unbelievable young team. I mean, I think the future of Tourmaline is going to go on for 20 years. It's tremendous. I mean, unless somebody, you know, one of these big buys them, <laughs> big integrated might just decide they like oil and gas at the game and buy them because, yeah. because they've gotten rid of their own G and G team. So now they're going to need yeah. Tourmalines. Anyway. You know, Canadian Natural Resources Arc. I mean, the the basically the the intermediate. You know these these companies that that are existing right now. I would put them all in that category. Mm-hmm. You know, these are just absolutely tremendous businesses run by you know very very credible people. I think you read at the end of Brett Wilson's book. It was Penn West that was like his best investment. Do you remember those days? Oh yeah, I was there for all of those days. Yeah, yeah. He made a yeah. That was a 
that was also probably a good exit for him too, because so, that didn't go, that didn't go on, you know, that didn't uh, uh, last, so to speak. But, uh, but it's coming back again and, you know, in this, in this other entity called Obsidian and uh, that's being very well received in the market. And uh, they've got some good people there working, working hard to make that a successful business. What advice would you give to a young person looking to build a career in energy or investment banking, finance, or just in general? So I, I, you know, as you can probably tell, I'm quite excited about energy. And I, I believe that the energy sector is going to be a, a terrific place for a young person. I think that there are so few young people you know, entering the, the sector right now that, frankly, you're going to be able to write your own ticket. So that's an easy one. Uh, as far as the financial services sector and, and in particular, uh, in particular investment banking, which I'm most familiar with having, having, uh, you know, had a long history running those types of businesses. That is a business with a lot of sort of secular challenges and, uh, and they have to do with technology having disrupted the revenue models of the businesses. So, I would say to you that I believe that the, I could be dead wrong, but I believe that the investment banking sector is going to, the capital markets attributes of it where I worked will become automated, almost 100% automated. Uh, there will be very few people. It'll be extremely low margin, high volume business. And that the main, and so you will have to have like, the, you, you will have to have big market share. Like it, it's just, you're not, you will not be able to be a small company trading stocks, hoping that that it's in and of itself will be a profit center. You might have those capabilities in order to support other attributes of your business, but it's not going to be the primary driver of your revenue. Where I believe that that investment banks are going is particularly in the materials and the, and the energy sector is you're going to have to have high performing uh, technically competent professionals in M and A and advisory. And those people will be rewarded in ways that you can't possibly imagine because they'll be tr bringing tremendous value to the issuers. Creative deal making. Exactly. And that, you know, it takes a very special type of person to be, you know, the, the to have the personality, the work ethic, you know, the contacts, the technical knowledge to be able to stand up in front of the boards and the management teams at, at these, what are now very sophisticated companies, pitch a deal and then make it happen. So that will be, if I'm pursuing a career in, in the financial services sector in the, on the sell side, I, I want to be in that pod of the business and then Recognize, you know, tell your wife or husband that you are not going to be around All for day. 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because you're going to be busy. Um, yeah. Very, very challenging business for sure. How many people do you think recognize that creative deal making that actually provides value? How many guys out there or, or women can... That, it's that a very short that. list of people. I would say it's the old 80-20 rule. You yeah. know, like 20% of the bankers do 80% of the deals for sure. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of other services. And success breeds success. Right. Right. So the more deals you do, the more deals you do. But good deals, not just deals. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I know a lot of investment bankers and, and you're right. I mean, Warren Buffett famously hates investment bankers yeah. because they'll just, they'll do any deal. But uh, by the same token, deal frequency is something that's important to bankers as well as deal quality. And you have to find that balance for sure. So how many good deal makers are there? Oh, you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the number, but you know, there's again, by attrition, you know, by Darwinian selection right. in the sector, let's say the guys that are in the sector right now are pretty good. They actually do good deals. I would, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that hmm. people have long, well, memories. people have, people have not been able to like, there have been very few deals, you know, the bankers that are doing deals yeah. are the good ones because there have been very few deals. <laughs> You know, the, in the in the early two thousands, Trevor, we would do five financings a week. Yeah. yeah, a week. You know what? There's a lot of high quality people in this in this business. We're very lucky to 
you know, it, it's a it's a sector that has historically used a lot of capital, so that's been it's been a great business to bank. Those days are coming back. You know, they will need capital again. As I said, the cycle will turn. Either margins will be compressed and the earnings won't be quite as good, so companies will need to raise money. But, you know, we're running out of energy, so we're going to need to drill wells. They're going to need capital. I mean, it's coming. And so it'll be a great place to bank again in, in the future. When you guys are doing five financing this a week, did you get that tingling feeling then? Maybe I was too, too young. Good. <laughs> I was too young. I was too young. It was, it was just a great, it was a, it was an unbelievable time. Yeah. We thought it was going to go on forever. It was incredible. We were the Kings of the world. Like, I mean, five deals on like, I remember one day we had four deals one day. I mean, that would have been crazy. Right. But they were a four small deals or three small deals and one big deal. So I'm, we're calling investors with four term sheets on a single day. Yeah, those, well, those were the days when not all the companies were great, but there was so much demand for energy in those days. Remember, 2002 to 2007, oil had gone from, you know, $10 to 50 or something, right? So it got up 500%. Uh, so people were, you know, the, the industry was flourishing, and there were all these new ideas, and we hadn't consolidated into big resource plays in those days. The... It was the very, very early days of horizontal drilling, even, you know, multi-stage fracking was just coming, yeah. you know, it hadn't even started yet. So it was a, it was a glorious time, tremendous, you know, tremendous excitement, uh, in the investment banking industry, trying to serve that need. A lot of opportunity. Yeah. Did you know anyone at the time who did put the brakes on your on your excitement? Was there anyone that you kind of uh, looked towards? Oh, there's a, there's a you know I'm not going to mention any names, but you know there are some they knew that great investors that you know they navigated knew. these twists and turns well, yeah. but they're you know they're they're great investors for a reason. Yeah. So you know, there were many times in my career where a client would you know we just not wouldn't talk, and then one day. Out of the blue, they'd call me and say, because I didn't call them anymore. They never returned my calls. Right. But they'd call me and say, hey, Trent, you know, I think that I, we need to sit down. I, you know, I'm looking at energy again and, it, you know, it's got to increase our weight. So I want to hear what you have to say. So, yeah, there are many great investors out there that were able to navigate those. Some might say that investment banking, you swim with the sharks, but you eat well. Do you miss swimming with the sharks? No, not really. I no, I had, I I loved my career and I love my partners and my employees and I'm so very lucky and humbled to have had that opportunity. Uh for me, what I find really exciting now is is uh separating myself from the investment banking attributes of the business and and more trying to be influential in the formation of capital and and the formation of businesses. Did you load up on any stocks in the in the in the bottom of twenty twenty? Did you back the truck up on any? I'd be. Are you Calgary's newest billionaire? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so. I, I'd say to you that I mean, it, you know, very lucky to have to have been in the seat that I was in and to have the comfort and the you know the knowledge that I had. You know, a big part of life is being lucky, and so I'm just going to say that I was lucky enough to, you know, to be knowledgeable about the sector, to know the personalities and the people and the assets and and. At an appropriate point in time, it became evident that that uh, our sector had been washed out. Now, I, I will, I will, I'm not going to tell you that I predicted we'd go on a 20 month vertical run because I didn't. You know, I was very, you know, we in the sector were very roughed up by a, a difficult time, but it became increasingly evident as time went on that something had shifted dramatically for the, like for the worse in terms of supply uh, of commodities as a result of COVID and the previous five years. And, uh, and so as a result, my comfort level with the sector is already very high. And then when that reinforced the attributes of, of the trade, if you will, it wasn't very difficult for, for me to, you know, running overweight in my personal portfolio in energy. Mm -hmm. Are you selling now? No, nope. <laughs> no. That's a good sign. Oh, maybe. I always said <laughs> when the headliner is fifty cent at the uh, Cowboys again, I'll sell. Yeah, yeah. These businesses are very healthy. I mean, 
companies uh, are paying big, big dividends. Like they're just they're transformed. They're utterly transformed. And you've got to always manage your risk as an investor. That's the number one thing. You know, we've had a $30 pullback in crude oil. I think it got to like 40 at one point. That's a good pullback. Get the animal spirits, calm them down a little bit. And, uh, and now we see, you know, the commodity sort of grinding it out in that, in that $90 range. So I, uh, you know, I personally believe there's a lot of margin in the business and I, and I'm, I'm very curious to see how the, how the energy crisis unfolds. We're going to Europe this fall just to take it all in to see what the man on the street is saying. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting time. It's a glorious time in the oil and gas sector. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Uh, very uh, very honored to, to be to be a part of your uh, program. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Very casual conversation, but uh, hopefully anyone who does listen learns something and lives better. Great, thanks. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you like what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.